Welcome back to Module 7. In this video, we're going to go through highlights from several different chapters in OpenStax Astronomy. I kind of call it the Solar System Grand Tour, although the slides in this particular video themselves don't actually cover details about the planets. We saw a brief overview of the difference between inner planets and outer planets in Chapter 7. We explored Earth in detail in Chapter 8, and we will have in the video linked here a planet tour that I think does a better job than I could um, that highlights some of the cool, unique aspects of each planet in our solar system. That video will also talk about what happens to the sun when it runs out of fuel, and so it will be a mix of fun facts about our solar system as well as reminders of stellar evolution, and so it's a really good fit in our curriculum here. So what we're going to focus on instead is the cosmic debris that's left over in the solar system once we've cataloged the sun, the eight planets, and the dwarf planets. So cosmic debris falls into two main categories. It is either mostly rocky, and so the largest objects that fall into this category are called asteroids, and the smallest objects, while technically in space, are called meteoroids. When they interact with Earth, that's the time when we really care about them. And we will talk about how the, or the terms meteors and meteorites are different from each other. The other big category is icy material. And primarily what we're talking about when we're talking about this leftover debris is comets. So <clears throat> comets sometimes have the nickname dirty snowballs because they are a mix of ices of different types as well as um, dust, more complex molecules that could have built themselves into, into rocky uh, material if they were closer to the uh, sun in the early solar system. Comets and asteroids are really the leftovers that didn't get built into planets. All right, so let's start with asteroids. One of the other videos that will be in our set of, um, set of supplementary videos is the one linked here, which shows asteroids being discovered over time. And that video does a really good job of showing that our ability to find asteroids is based on our technology. And so we find more and more asteroids as time goes on, not because all of a sudden they are there, but because we now have better technology, better telescopes, bigger telescopes that can find these smaller objects. The book sometimes calls, uh, textbooks sometimes call asteroids small worlds. And when we use big and small in astronomy, it can be hard to understand what we really mean. These are chunks of rock that are smaller than Earth, certainly, but they are larger than houses, larger than objects that we would think of as big on our everyday scales. Most asteroids are found in between Mars and Jupiter in what's called the asteroid belt, and the dwarf planet Ceres that we mentioned before is inside the asteroid belt. This particular picture here has terms um, Greeks, Trojans, and Hildas. We aren't getting into the details of those. Um, they aren't different in the material that those asteroids are made out of. They are different in the way that they orbit the sun, and we won't get into that. You're welcome to read about it in chapter 13, though. Because Mars is right next to the asteroid belt, when we actually look at Phobos and Deimos, the two small moons of Mars, we recognize that they probably are captured asteroids, that they didn't form with the planet Mars, but that they eventually found themselves in stable orbits around Mars as things moved around in the, inner sol in the solar system early on. Unlike the asteroid belt, which most people have heard of from K-12 science, the other primary source of this cosmic debris is not something that often shows up in K-12 science classes, and that's the Kuiper Belt. The asteroid belt is named after the type of object that is in it, asteroids. The Kuiper Belt is not. It is named after the scientist who discovered it. 
And the Kuiper belt extends from about 30 astronomical units, so 30 times farther from the sun than the Earth is, out to about 50, uh, maybe 60 astronomical units. This is where we can find Pluto, which has been designated a dwarf planet since 2006, and all of the time would be considered a Kuiper belt object, KBO, because it is in the Kuiper belt. As we discovered, Eris, Haumea, and Makemake, the other dwarf planets that we named in Chapter 7, they are also Kuiper Belt objects. Now, it is worth noting the history of Pluto briefly, because it's always one that uh, creates a little bit of debate, discussion, uh, what have you. Pluto was originally discovered in 1930. The two pictures on the left part of our slides have arrows pointing out the tiny, tiny pinpoint of light that was Pluto. And these were two separate images taken of the same patch of sky. And um, it was Clyde Tombaugh who discovered it by having a blink comparator. So the two slides, rather than having to have like the wor world's toughest spot the difference puzzle, they go into a machine that at the time took these glass photographic plates and basically created almost a two-frame GIF, you might think of it, that is going back and forth and you can see the object move back and forth. Follow-up observations showed that this was indeed an object that was moving against the background stars and as it was tracked more and more, the orbit showed that it was orbiting the Sun, it was named a dwarf planet in 2006, and at that point we really didn't know that much about it. Um, the very first time that a spacecraft got close-up observations of it was in 2015, when the New Horizons mission took the image that we see here on the far right. Scientists are still working to study all of that data that was gathered by the New Horizons mission. It was never intended to orbit Pluto, and in fact, it was on a big slingshot out past Pluto to get close-up imagery and then beyond to study more Kuiper Belt objects. Pluto is the largest of the Kuiper Belt objects, um, and there's a lot that we don't know about these, about these objects. This image here shows in yellow the path that New Horizons took through our solar system. Out from the inner solar system, you can actually see a small bend in that line when it went past Jupiter. It's called a gravitational assist. It was actually able to speed the thing up. And uh, we see where Eris, Haumea, and Makemake were at the time of that Pluto flyby. There's not going to be a study using New Horizons of those other dwarf planets, but we do have the ability to see other objects that are along that path. So after flying near Pluto in 2015, New Horizons flew past an additional Kuiper Belt object in 2019 that is being studied, and this is the, um, the imagery that we have of it. Uh, it has a name now, but it was originally KBO 2014 MU69, and now it's Arakoth. And it's not the only Kuiper Belt object that we know of, but it is the one that we've flown the closest to, except for Pluto. So it is um, something where the New Horizons mission is ongoing and will continue to give us useful information. But it's also important to recognize that these Kuiper Belt objects in general, they are a mix of rocky objects and icy objects, and they're all roughly in stable orbits around the sun at those very, very big distances. The objects that have orbits that bring them into the inner solar system are comets. So the same kind of category of stuff that is in the Kuiper Belt, but also in a region that's even further away. So comets are mostly made of ices. They're sometimes called dirty snowballs, and they have a central nucleus, a central um, solid region that can be between one and a hundred kilometers across. So these are the size of cities, uh, much larger than asteroids tend to be. And those ices that they're made of tend to be water ice, carbon dioxide ice, methane, ammonia, things that in the inner solar system 
would have been in gas form as the solar system formed, but in the outer solar system, they were solids and able to collect into these um, comets. When they get near the sun, the nucleus sublimates. Sublimate is the fancy way of saying it goes from a solid to a gas. If we think about the word melt, we're familiar with that word. Melt means go from a solid to a liquid. An ice cube can melt. But in space, because we can't have liquid water, it goes straight from a solid to a gas. If you have ever had dry ice at a party, the kind of thing that it keeps things cold and has this kind of cool effect of like fog, um, sometimes used at Halloween parties, the process that you're seeing with that dry ice is sublimation. The carbon dioxide ice is going from solid to gas form. So near the sun, as the nucleus sublimates, it makes two different tails. And one really, really important thing for us to understand is that those tails are not behind the comet. Instead, those tails point away from the sun. The reason that they develop is that gas is created because it's warmer, and then the solar wind basically causes those um, atoms, those molecules, to speed up and move away with the solar wind. So when you see comet tails, they aren't flowing behind them like someone with long hair who's running um, through a field. That is being blown in a very particular direction away from the sun. Now, short period comets, ones where we see them come back uh, more than once, and it takes less than 200 years to come all the way back around. Halley's Comet is one of the most famous of these. They come from, in general, the Kuiper Belt. They have their out, outside part of their orbit in the Kuiper Belt. They come into the inner solar system and then back out again. Long period comets, more than 200 years to go from one sighting to the next, or we only see them once, they actually likely come from a region that is even farther from the sun called the Oort cloud. Now the Oort cloud may contain over a trillion different objects, but it is extremely far from the sun. This diagram here can be tough to understand fully. The line through the middle is a logarithmic scale. So from the sun to earth is one astronomical unit. The same amount of distance on the screen is representing 10 times the amount of distance, and so on. And it shows us Voyager 1 on this diagram. Voyager 1 is the farthest human-made object that exists from the sun. It was launched in the 1970s. It's been moving away from the Earth very quickly ever since. And it is the furthest thing away from the sun that we as human beings have created. It is a little over 100 um, astronomical units away from the sun, but the Oort cloud doesn't start until about 1,000 or 10,000 AU. So we are nowhere close to being able to study objects in the Oort cloud unless they come as comets into the inner solar system. But we do know what they're likely made out of. Um, it's just something that we need to be aware. It is difficult to study things that are far away, small, and they are not very shiny. Keep in mind, this is an Oort cloud that is surrounding the sun. We can still study all of the stars even farther away because those stars are very bright and creating their own light. Objects in the Oort cloud they are not shiny, they are not big, and they are not creating their own light. Okay, so as a reminder, uh, something I said before now in diagram form, comet tails point away from the sun because of the solar wind. So when we think of the sun um, that we talked about in chapter 15 and 16, the sun has this constant outflow of charged particles called the solar wind, the Earth's magnetic field protects us from that. Comet tails kind of show us and helped us study the solar wind. And let me go back one slide. This comet here of the heliopause, we're not gonna get into that detail, but that's actually where the solar wind slows down 
and becomes roughly the same pressure as the pressure between stars. So it's kind of like the sun is blowing a bubble and that's the edge of the bubble. And Voyager 1 is right on the edge of that um, kind of pressure bubble. But the Oort cloud is still material in what we should consider our solar system. Okay, so comet tails point away from the sun, but when they are far away from the sun, comets do not have those tails. As a reminder, those tails show up when the comet heats up and sublimates. So the Rosetta spacecraft was a European Space Agency mission that orbited Comet 67P in 2014 and even dropped a probe onto the surface to take really, really close-up images of that comet. So um, these pictures are the best, closest observations that we have of a comet. There are more projects in the works. There are more active um, missions that are studying comets, but this is one of the more famous ones. And it is worth recognizing that we can figure out the size um, of this particular object much easier than more distant objects. And if we were to gently bring it down to Earth's surface, it would be the size of a city. Uh, and in fact, I'm not going to have this link um, be something that shows up in our video playlist, but it's actually a set of images that shows what happens if you put um, the Comet 67P on famous European cities, since this was a um, European Space Agency mission. So it's kind of cool to see just how far it spans from um, one London landmark to another, or one Rome landmark to another. Okay. The last things for us in this particular video are the terms meteor and meteorite. And technically there is this term to meteoroid, which is when they're in space. All of these terms are really describing the same general category of stuff, small, rocky, pebbles or dust grains that interact with Earth. That's really the, the big difference between the asteroids and the comets. We can study those for their own sake. These terms are for describing things that affect the Earth. Meteoroid are when they are in space and will become um, part of a meteorite, which makes it to Earth's surface, or a meteor, the part that uh, burns up as it goes through the night sky. Meteors are typically um, referred to as shooting stars. So if you've ever wished on a shooting star, um, what you are seeing is a small dust grain that is just burning up in Earth's atmosphere and then it's gone. So meteoroids, the ones in space that make it all the way down to the surface, become meteorites and then we can study them. They are basically portions of pristine space debris that formed when the solar system formed or came from, we sometimes have rocks that were on Mars, but because of a um, impact on Mars, were um, put back out into the solar system and then headed towards Earth. Meteorites tend to be um, categorized based on what they're made of. We aren't going to get into those categories. Um, I'm not asking you to memorize them. But they give us these different snapshots of what's available in the solar nebula as the solar system formed. Now, meteor showers are really interesting because they tend to occur every year and they tend to appear to come from the same patch of sky from one year to the next. And that's where we get names for them from. I'll have a list on the next slide as we finish up this video. But one thing I want to point out is that um, if we think about these railroad tracks, we know from understanding of railroad tracks that those are not actually physically coming to a point in the distance that just looks like it from perspective. Meteor showers do the same thing. They look like they're all coming from a single distant point and that all of the shooting stars within a single meteor shower appear like they're coming from the same location. That is a perspective um, thing. So, the name of the meteor shower comes from the constellation where that central point appears to be. So for example, the Geminids in mid-December, that is a link to a video that will be in our YouTube playlist, they seem to come from the constellation Gemini. And that video will show um, 
images of the meteor shower against a background labeled um, sky. So if you haven't really ever seen a meteor shower, I strongly encourage you to try um, to look for one. Most of the famous yearly meteor showers have a known source of all of that, those dust grains, different comets um, or asteroids that have left behind basically these clouds of dust that we reach the same time every year because it's a physical patch of sky that we're getting, a physical patch of space that we're getting to in that same time, year after year. The two that are, in general, the strongest are the Perseid meteor shower and the Gemini, Geminid meteor shower. So the Perseids happen in August, and they are probably the strongest meteor shower, but August is also a place where, in a lot of um, locations on Earth, it's the cloudiest time of year. And that can be tough to, um, to actually have a clear night on the exact right days. The Geminids um, happen in December, and in Michigan it's super cold. <laughs> but if you get a chance to, they are also a very strong meteor shower at their peak, um, and it always tends to be around the same um, time of year. Please be aware that sometimes it's a day before or a day after because our year is not a perfect 365 days, uh, but it's always roughly around that time, and there's, there's lots of resources to be able to look up on your own um, what those look like. So this is the end of our discussion of cosmic debris. And as a reminder, we have that separate planet tour video from Kurtzgesagt um, that goes through kind of the fun facts of the planets beyond our initial discussion from Chapter 7. What we have left in this module is a section of Chapter 21 so that we think about how we figure out or how we study exoplanets, planets outside our solar system, and then chapter 30, which is a discussion of life in the universe. So I will see you in those remaining chapters.